Uh, okay, today we are going to continue to talk about the relation between the density functional theory of freezing and the phase field crystal model, okay? So just a quick recap what we uh, have just done for yesterday is that uh, we start with some fundamental physics. You have a many particle system, right? Then you can write down the Hamiltonian and write down the partition function. And in the end, uh, you can write down, uh, you, you, you can obtain the free energy functional for a system with interacting particles. And usually you are expecting to get something like an ideal turn and also a turn that's coming from the interaction, right? So that's a, maybe one of the simple way to, to put that. If, if you don't have any interaction, you are expecting the behavior of ideal gas. But if you have interaction, you have some extra free energy co contribution. So we basically start with this kind of physics. And you know, because of the interaction, you are expecting uh, the free energy would contain the information of how the particle interacting with, with each other. So generally you are expecting the free energy can be right in terms of a lot of summation of this uh, correlation function. It's either the two or three or four. Uh, in, in theory, um, it, you should sum all sorts of these uh, uh, correlation function, okay? Uh, but since we are trying to uh, make a connection between uh, the physics and the phase field crystal, which I, ha I haven't actually shown you the connection yet, the physics we would like to catch is actually, since we know a good model, a good phenomenological model should at least uh, rediscover uh, this kind of free, free energy, right? So it should contain something like the bulk turn and also a co correlation uh, relation. So we did a little bit manipulation, just, just trying to find uh, if now we consider the solid system, which is a, is a system with, with a special structure, right? So if we just take a very simple approximation saying that the solid itself is an inhomogeneous liquid. So it's like a liquid, but you have certain perturbation, but that perturbation has certain structure. So we are consider the limit where the structure, the solid, is a perturbed liquid. So the amplitude of the variation is not that large. So by taking that assumption, you can truncate uh, this uh, free energy functional. So in the end, uh, just quickly, we see that you can return only the qu uh, quadratic terms, right? Furthermore, wh what we, we did yesterday is to, to use the score gradient expansion to write this correlation in terms of like spatial derivatives. So without going into the detail again, uh, in the end, what we are having is something like the phase field model. You do have a spatial gradient turn in the energy, and that turn is going to penalize anything changing sharply on the interface. But in the meantime, you also have a bulk term, the bulk energy. But since we only retain the lowest order term in the free energy, so only have this kind of uh, quadratic term will not give us a stable solid liquid system, right? You, at least you will need a, need a bulk energy that contains two minima, two minima. So which means we still need to find out, we still need to add two more terms, a cubic term and a quartic term to complete the ginz mandel theory. So that's the concept. So we talked about that and we can add in the cubic term and the quartic term. So the calculation uh, involves a little bit the symmetry consideration, which is uh, quite natural because we are talking about a crystal with certain symmetry, right? And how the density wave of that crystal is going to decay across the solid liquid interface. So of course we are expecting the final form of, of the free energy should depend on all these reciprocal lattice factors. All right, so the key feature of this kind of gains Lyell theory, right, or uh, the density functional theory is actually that. You see, you will end up with a form, a free energy functional, that look quite like a phase field, like a phase field, because you will have, let me just jump to the final, because the feature would be, you will have all these local terms, that is basically the terms without special derivatives. So you have all these bulk terms, right? It's basically a double well potential, and it depends on what kind of lattice structure you are talking about, then the amplitude here is the amplitude of the 
specific selective factors. So for example, if, if we are talking about the BCC structures, then you are expecting 12 amplitudes. If it is a 2D hexagonal lattice, then you have a six amplitudes. So it depends on the symmetry you are talking about, you have different number of degree freedom, but in the end, the Ginsburg Lyell theory or the double well potential is basically a double well in a higher dimensional space. And we sort of use the symmetry to, to argue that for the 2D hexagonal lattice, it is basically a 3D uh, hyperspace. Then for each point, you have this A1, A2, A3 to form the space. With each set of A1, A2, A3 the value, you can calculate one energy. But you will find that when A1 equal to A2 equal to A3 equal to the solid amplitude, it's going to be one of the energy minima. And when all the amplitude vanishes, that will be the other minima. So although it looks like a, a multivariable kind of theory, but it is basically just a double well in a higher, uh, in, in, in a higher dimensions. What actually capture the physics, right? Uh, besides the, this bulk energy, is this uh, square gradient terms, right? You, 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 you pick up the, the feature that the coefficient now depends on the inner product of the interface normal and also the reciprocal lattice factor, which means if you have a BCC structure, now depends on where you are cutting the solid to be in contact with liquid. So when you change the interface normal Z, the inner product is going to change with, with that interface normal, right? So every time you select a planar, the planar interface to separate the solid and liquid, you immediately will get a different free energy functional because all the coefficient will be different. The question is, how can you uh, find out all the amplitude, amplitude, amplitude profile that will minimize the free energy? When you find that, you just substitute the amplitude back. Then you can evaluate the energy, right? And because of that, orientation dependent coefficient. You are expecting this kind of against Lyell theory will exhibit to a certain degree the, NS, the surface energy and isotropy itself. Okay, so that's where we, we were yesterday. And today we are going to make a connection with the uh, uh, phase field crystal. Okay, so I think what I show a little bit the result yesterday is just to show you that if you, you use the against Lyell theory we talk about, and use the realistic input from the MD simulation, you can actually really compare the density profile, how the density profile decay from the solid side to the liquid side with the MD simulation, right? So the, the, the black solid circle are measured from the MD simulation, and we just use this uh, potential for BCC iron. And you can see our, uh, the, the, the Gensland theory can pretty well how the amplitude is changing over the solid liquid surface. All right. Yeah, so uh, that's our work today. I'm going to show you this relation. <laughs> but good, so, uh, wh so what we did is just to establish some fundamental physics we think a good theory should follow, right? So I think that's a pretty good physics. And whether the phase field crystal uh, can actually uh, have the same feature. Uh, if not, probably it's not that good model. But as I just give you a preview yesterday, so that's something we're going to talk about. The PFC results actually agree very well, and there's a reason for that. All right. So before I move on to uh, our material today, I still want to sh show you one thing more, is that you can actually change the, change the interface normal, right? For a 2D hexagonal lattice, you can change the interface normal, and you can see the profile is actually changing as I uh, cut my crystal either along uh, different uh, orientations. But I didn't show you yesterday is that once you have all the profiles, you, you can use those profiles, right, and plug them back to the free energy to get a, a number, and that number is the solid liquid surface energy, right? So let me quickly, quickly show you that the sample I was showing you yesterday, in addition, I calculate the energy here. Right, so on top you can see uh, I start from the angle zero, which is uh, in the x direction, uh, parallel to my k1. So now my k1 to k6 is start from the zero degree 60 and 120, etc. So the profile you are getting, you can plug in the free energy to calculate the surface energy. And you can see the gamma uh, changing with, with the 
crystal orientations. Uh, the reason I'm only plotting from zero to 60 degree because you have this six-fold symmetry, so you are expecting a repeated structure after you scan the interface normal from zero to 60 degree. All right, so of course you are expecting this kind of six-fold uh, anisotropy showing in this Ginzmandel theory. Okay. It, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one has a right. Um, right. So it will have more. So, yeah, so you will have more uh, surface uh, along that direction. Right, right. So you will see that too. But also have it rotated by 30 degrees so such that the passage which is along the x-axis has a lower energy. So uh, when we carry out this calculation, we have a fixed set of k. So my k1 is always a, a parallel to the x-direction, etc. So if that, that does not change, you will always get, uh, let me show you the other one. So how do I change if I want the, the x to be the lower energy? So, yeah, you, you, you can arbitrarily uh, choose the uh, where your K1 is, right? So, uh, you can redo the calculation, but that just, uh, so basically that only change the K dot N, right? K dot Z. So, either you can fix the receivability factor and change the, the normal, or you, you fix normal and changing K. Did you say that your simulation Next is corresponding to the crystal that you say. Yeah, the n direction, yeah. The z direction, let me see. Uh, I didn't say that, that but I think it's, uh, so yeah, z actually. I, I'm using z direction as my interface normal. So here's k dot z. So zero degree means z is in this direction, right? Z, zero degree means uh, is par parallel to k1. Okay. All right, so uh, let's move on. To, to today's material. So, any questions so far? Okay, uh, today we only have one mission. Hey, yes. Yeah, 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 you can do it. So, I on, only, six, only 0 to 60, but I, I didn't use that as my radius. Because the magnitude, I mean, I have to subtract some value, so, uh, yeah. Otherwise, the, the, pole, the, the polar plot is going to be quite, quite rounded. So. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. So, so you can get the thickness if you want. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I, yeah. I, I'm really excited because uh, all of the efforts before are nothing related to PFC. It's actually quite a solid physics, right? <laughs> so I, I'm really happy actually she didn't get uh, so engaged about uh, the result already. So let's see uh, what happened uh, after I introduce the PFC, the amplitude equation to you. <laughs> okay, so let me show you. So don't have, let me, let me show you, go back to the first page. All right, um, so the phase field crystal has the free energy like this, right? And we sort of derived that in the first class. It has a strong roots in the relative and convection pattern formation theory. And it follow the re, uh, local conserved dynamics, all right? But there's no guarantee that this kind of pattern formation phenomenological free energy will have anything to do with the classical density function of free, right? So that's what I'm going to make a connection to today, okay? All right, so uh, we want to make the connection uh, between the phase field crystal to the Gaines-Blandel theory. So uh, you have already show, uh, you have already seen that in the tutorial session that the density field in the phase field crystal simulation will look like something oscillating, right? Right. And so that's I'm writing here. The red oscillating field is the density field you you get from the PFC. But as you you just see that the ginz theory, the older parameter we are using, is actually corresponding to the amplitude of this one mode approximation. So usually in PFC, you don't really have that function. You only have a Poisson as a function of space. 
Well, you probably can say I can do a local Fourier transform to get amplitude, but that's too much work, right? But I just want to make a connection here is that we actually only have the Psi field in the PFC, but if you, we want to compare with the Ginsburg Landau, we will need certain tools or skills to get from this uh, density representation to only have this envelope information for the solid liquid interface, right? So that's actually one of the techniques I'm going to show you. It's called the amplitude equation. And how can we use the multi-scale analysis to obtain the amplitude equation for the PFC? So I can start with the evolution equation of PFC, which is only involves a density field per sign. But from there, I'm going to use some theoretical uh, uh, techniques. In the end, you are going to get the evolution equation for the amplitude. But everything is just from the phase field crystal. Okay. Then once we have the final form of the amplitude equation, we can see whether that has the important uh, like the orientation dependent square grain coefficient coming out of it. Okay. Right, so the goal is right right here. We want to extract information of the amplitude from the PFC. All right, so if we can do that, then make, maybe we can make a connection between the phase field crystal the gain mm -hmm. theory and the, and the density functional theory. Okay, right, so the goal is to get the amplitude, so that's why we call this the amplitude equations. All right. Okay, so uh, uh, in 2007, uh, we basically performed the amplitude equation to the PFC. So uh, there, uh, I'm going to show you most of the paper, but uh, there are still some detail uh, missing. So uh, if you are interested in uh, explaining more, uh, feel free to check out the paper. Okay, all right. So I think it, it is quite important to actually uh, get a feeling about, uh, like for the solid liquid system, right? Like we know the analysis for that. So that's what we are going to do here, all right? So uh, we'll, I, I would like to make a uh, estimation on how this uh, slow modulation of the density waves, right? Yeah, I would like to first to estimate how uh, slow it actually vary across the space when the parameter in the PFC, the epsilon, is not large. And you will find that, as I was showing you yesterday about a few simulations, is that if, I, if you increase the value of epsilon, you will start to get a sharper, sharper interface. But when epsilon is small, you will start to see the interface become wider and wider. And what's the analytical relation? That's something I'm going to discuss here. So it is quite the same thing that uh, if we, we want to see how the smoke perturbation of the density is going to uh, grow over time and space, the typical thing is just to uh, linearize the evolution equation and to check the power perturbation is going to evolve over space and time. So, so that's something we have seen maybe in, in the, the second lecture, all right? So just plugging these insights, all right? For example, if we want to have a solid liquid interface like this, we can just uh, use the, uh, mean the mean density of the solid liquid coexisting density, right? So roughly, uh, we can make an expansion around certain density. So just by plugging it in, you can get a very nice dispersion relation, just saying if epsilon is really small and the band of the unstable mode is just have a little tip above zero. And from there, from this kind of very tiny narrow band of the unstable wave number, can we start from there and to est estimate any kind of uh, special modulation, how slow or how fast it will go. So, First, we can get this uh, dispersion relation. So you just plugging in, you can linearize this cubic term, right? So you have this a plus b to the third power and just keep a linear term. You only have this uh, uh, three times the mean density squared times the, the delta rho. And other thing, I just directly plug in uh, this psi bar plus delta psi. As, like on the left hand side, the mean density just a constant, doesn't change with time. So it, it, it will not be there. And also the same thing here for, for this sign. And immediately here, I just combine this three psi bar, three psi bar squared 
which is a constant here. I didn't do anything else. All right. We know that we care about how the perturbations corresponding to is the different wave numbers kind of perturbation. What's their growth rate, right? Because now we want to argue if I only have a very narrow of this unstable wave number, and how can I get from there to estimate the, the width? So first, I need to know uh, whether I do have a small width of this unstable, unstable band. So I just uh, transform what, uh, what we have before in the reciprocal space. And the transformation can be done by simply assume the perturbation has a certain wavelength k and its corresponding growth rate is sigma k. And plugging immediately you will get this. So that's something Gu uh, has been showing you using a diffusion equation as one example, okay? So basically, every time you see the Laplace and you got a minus k squared, that's it, if you compare those two, all right? So now we only want a small band of the unstable wave number, right? So we know the periodicity has this wave number of the magnitude of one. So really close to the onset, the minus k squared plus one equal to zero because it only excites the mode that prefer the wave number equal to one. So in that case, if I want to get a very small band, then I know for this solid liquid interface, I have part of solid and part of liquid. I would require that psi is very close to, or minus, or like three psi squared has to be very close to epsilon, right? If that's too large, it's going to open a wide band. So I would need that to be very close. So you, in that case, you have a solid liquid, so which means the coexist density is somewhere around that value, so which make, make that vanish. So on the solid side, it can excite the unstable mode. But in the liquid, every mode is stable, right? So you know, because the phase separation, you know the Psi bar must be around the square root of epsilon over three. Okay. Okay, so from here, you know, whenever you pick up the parameter in PFC, certain value of epsilon, then you immediately know if there's a solid liquid coexistence, a system, then the mean density roughly is around the order of uh, square, root of, square root of epsilon, right? So this term basically, uh, because this is proportional to the square root of epsilon, and the whole thing will be at the order of epsilon. So the dispersion curve can be drawn like this, right? So if on the solid side, a little bit. So still this term is uh, negative because, because this negative term outside. So you can have this uh, epsilon minus three per side bar. So if that's slightly above zero, so that's going to give you a band of the wave number that's going to have a positive growth rate. Right, so we are looking at that regime and seeing that if epsilon minus three per psi square is really close to zero, and in that case, if you, if you have a solid equal interface, how this special modulation is, is going to decay or, or change across the interface. So what we, uh, we did here is just to uh, linearize the equation, trying to get a dispersion relation, but all the efforts later you are going to see is that we can just use a very simple analysis to show you that the interface width will change with one over the square root of epsilon. So when epsilon is really small, you are expecting a really, really wide uh, interface, right? But still, we need a little bit of effort to, to, to go there, right? But here, just to, to estimate, uh, if, if you have this unstable band of wavelengths, uh, for example, how big is the growth rate is roughly proportional to sigma, uh, proportional to epsilon, and what's the width? The, the width will be roughly uh, also proportional to the square root of that, right? Okay, so as we just est established, right? If uh, in the coexistent region, then you are expecting the growth rate roughly is at order of epsilon, right? The first term here. And how about the width of the unstable band? So that you can solve by saying, okay, when does this dispersion curve go across two zeros, right, roughly that. So I'm just setting this growth rate to zero. You can do a little bit of manipulation. Uh, basically, you don't have to care about it. it's prefactor because that will not give you anything like a zero. So you only have to consider turns like this and keep the lowest order of delta k because I'm expecting 
the, the, band, the bandwidth is small. So all this expansion, the lowest order term will be like delta, uh, is proportional to delta k squared. And it has to be balanced with the first term that's at the order of epsilon. So from there you can see the delta k, the bandwidth here, that has a positive growth rate is roughly proportional to the square root of, of epsilon. So here we didn't really care about uh, the exact relation like the coefficient will just give you a feeling that uh, you are expecting very close to the onset of instability. You have opened up a, a band. The, the width is roughly proportional to the square root of epsilon, right? And the growth rate roughly is at the order of epsilon, and that's it. All right, so we are very close to use those two results to estimate what's the uh, width of this special modulation, okay? All right, All right, so in that limit, in a small epsilon limit, if you can have any kind of uh, envelope modulation, right, uh, then you do a Fourier transform. You, so what is like an envelope? It's basically a superposition of different wave numbers mode, right? So now I only have this small tiny windows of bandwidth that I can use. So the question is that if I super, if I superimpose all these kinds of uh, uh, unstable uh, wave number, what is the amplitude profile looks like? And from there, I can know if there is a special uh, modulation and what's that length scale look like. So that's what we are going to do here. Right, so since uh, generally, we don't really care about that average, right? But the spatial variation could be the summation of all this unstable uh, wave number, just do a uh, Fourier integral. And we know the k minus k plus basically is those two value. So uh, roughly I only integrate over very tiny window of, of k. And this delta k not is just a, a sum value. It doesn't change with time because uh, we keep that uh, time variation uh, here, right? So if if it, at some instant you have some initial magnitude, and we know for certain mode it's going to grow exponentially. And for that sigma k, you can look up the dispersion curve, right? So I'm summing up this uh, contribution for a very tiny window of this unstable mode. So the only thing you have to do is just to manipulate this expression a little bit. So what you're doing is you can pull out, because I, I know the underlying oscillation is actually with the wave number kc. So I just uh, intentionally write this exponential ikc.r here. Since I'm adding one more term, I have to uh, divide the same term here. So right, so I didn't do anything, I just, just separate one term into two terms. But that's actually very informative, right? Because once I write that, I was, so what we are doing here is just saying, okay, this is the density oscillation. And the density oscillation can be written in terms of the underlying periodicity times something else, but that also change in space. So that's actually the spatial modulation we are looking at, okay? Right, so the red part here corresponding to uh, the same thing here that I'm drawing. But this exponential i k minus k c dot r represents some, the oscillation the envelope can also change over space. But since k minus kc roughly only has the order of epsilon, square root of epsilon, right? So any special modulation occurs at the length scale of epsilon, square, one over square root of epsilon times r, right? Because since this term, delta k, the wave number has this order of one over of, of something, then the length scale will be two pi over that. Right, so it's always an uh, uh, inverse relation. So here you can see if epsilon is a very, very small number, and this is basically a square root, take a square root and take an inverse. So if epsilon is really a small number, you take an inverse, right, it's going to be something large. So which means the special modulation can happen at the lead spacing length scale times maybe a really huge number. So which means this modulation could happen for over 100 lattice spacing, right? Because 
the R here, basically, it, we can say that is the uh, order of the, the wavelengths of the uh, underlying periodicity. But the modulation would occur at this one over square root of epsilon times R. Uh, so it, that is why, since we know that's the, the case, then for the phase field crystal, uh, that's the reason when you use a smaller value of epsilon, you are going to get a more and more diffusive interface. All right, so the, the width here is proportional to the square root of one over square root of, of epsilon. All right, so two more things is that since the integration is over a very tiny window of, of uh, wave number, so the oscillation, will, the magnitude will be proportional to the bandwidth, how many bandwidths you are summing up. So you can also argue that the, for small epsilon, the amplitude is roughly proportional to the, the width of the unstable wave number. So roughly that's the square root of, of the epsilon. And as well, the whole thing will grow over time with the growth rate sigma k. But sigma, sigma k is at the order of epsilon. So which means when epsilon is small, everything will, would grow very, very slowly, right? So you can also uh, know there will be a characteristic time scale. That's the inverse of epsilon times t. So again, when epsilon is, is really small number, then you have to wait for, uh, originally there is a one unit time, you can have something maybe, uh, okay, that, that's it. So you are expecting modulation is going to grow up rather slower uh, in this case because the uh, correct time scale is the is t over uh, epsilon. Okay, so the conclusion here, just uh, we, we, without really going to all the numbers, just by saying, okay, you have uh, a uh, bandwidth of unstable mode delta k proportional to uh, square root of epsilon and things like that. We are expecting for this uh, solid liquid coexistence, right? In the system, the density variation can be written as like underlying spacing times this modulation. But this modulation actually occurs at what? At a very slow, it has to go, go to a cross really large spatial range and T, I mean, also happens at a very long time. So basically, I'm absorbing this exponential term and those two terms in, the, in this amplitude, right? And also, the delta, delta per psi here, the magnitude, also is at the order of the square root of epsilon. All right, so I'm writing here. So the R here, basically, is this... Uh, delta k dot r, they, all, they always appear uh, together. So I'm writing this, uh, but the new variable would be related to r by what? By this delta k times something, right? But delta k is at the order of epsilon one half. So that's why I'm sort of just giving a new length scale to the system saying that uh, a, the, the modulation is a function of square root of epsilon times r because of this term. And also I'm rewriting this sigma t like a new time. And that's why I'm writing this uh, capital T is epsilon t. Okay? But I didn't do anything else. So far just uh, to argue that for a, a solid liquid interface you see in PFC would be quite diffusive if epsilon is very small. And that's it. All right. Which is consistent with uh, the simulation you have been doing or you have been seeing. Okay, okay so why we are making this argument, saying, okay, uh, we need, need to argue things like there are two different time, two different length scale in the system. Uh, we don't really care about time because uh, uh, we want to get a surface property at equilibrium, right? So everything there doesn't, does not change with time, it's, sta it's stationary. But we do want to study in detail what happened over, uh, in, in space. So with all these efforts, we basically trying to get uh, the modulation actually occur at very large length scale, okay? Then if that's the case, we can use a, per, a perturbative solution to, uh, to get something analytical. And one of the nice results will be the amplitude equation, all right? But before we move to amplitude equation, I'm going to show you something else.
right? So I can use this kind of uh, perturbative technique even to give me a very nice estimate of this solid liquid coexistence, right? And the reason I'm showing you this is that uh, uh, I don't know how many of you have the training in like uh, perturbation theory. Uh, usually, I would spend like half, uh, maybe one third of semester in classical mechanics to show my students the detail. So, but here will be a quick course. So, I, uh, so let me give you one example how to use this uh, kind of uh, perturbative technique to get something done. But here. I will leave the amplitude 2 equation as the second part, but as a very simple exercise just to see how this perturbative solution works. Uh, let me show you how you, how, can, how you can use this idea to calculate the solid liquid coexistence co density. So the way we are trying to get solution is just to solve the common tangent numerically, right? You, you can use a computer, you can use symbolic calculation and to do the trick. But, bef but, look, uh, but a while ago, the physics, they don't do that. <laughs> we just do everything by hand. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why the perturbation theory. It's a nice exercise and it's quite useful because later we can show you the amplitude equation using the technique. Well, part of, part, part of that will be perturbation. The other is the multi-scale analysis. But uh, let me spend some time in the perturb perturbation solution first. Okay. So uh, how do you get this uh, solid liquid coexistence density just by hand, for example, right? So from the hint over here, we know the coexistence co coexistent density roughly is scale, scale with the square root of epsilon. So very naively, you can say the liquid and the solid coexistence density will be just uh, the, the same coefficient that's uh, according to the scaling and times uh, two different numbers. And that's it, right? And that's your insights. And what you are going to do is saying, okay, if I want to get two phase coexist, and using what you get from pre previous lectures, you know how to evaluate the liquid density and solid density, but no, the liquid free energy density and the solid free energy density in terms of the free parameter epsilon and also their corresponding mean density, right? Things like those. I hope you still remember. And I think this is the case for BCC, that's right. And so I just write here to remind you that those are the relation uh, you will need in this kind of calculation. And you can actually obtain those two coexistence density just by applying the equilibrium condition, which means you are re requesting the solid liquid has the same chemical potential and also the pressure in two phases are the same. So I'm not going to show you the detail, but just show you the idea of this perturbation a perturbative scheme, right? Because you're going to see that the or original simple assumption is wrong. So you, you need to amend things along the way. But according to the uh, scaling analysis, you, you know that the mean density should scale like this. And you, you're simply saying, for example, two phases should have the same chemical potential, right? So mu solid equal to mu liquid. And the chemical potential will be just taking the free energy uh, the derivative of that respect to the density itself. So for example, uh, from here you just take derivative with respect to psi L, you are getting that as the liquid chemical potential, right? So immediately you know, since we are assuming that uh, psi liquid is this uh, psi one half times the psi bar L zero. Uh, let me see, if you plug in that here, right? Okay. So you will get a contribution that's one times that. So I'm have, having this term over here. But you also have this term times this minus epsilon, right? So that will give you, oh, I'm writing something wrong here. Okay. Uh, so there will be some extra term I'm missing here because you should have also a contribution that's minus epsilon to the two, uh, three half power times psi bar L naught. And also the same power, but that'll be psi L naught to the cube, so they don't cancel out. So it's some, some mistake I, I made here. But anyway, uh, you will have something from the three half power, something right here that I missed. But in a same sense, you can also evaluate the chemical potential in the solid. Right? You can just also take the uh, derivative of that. And seeing from the structure, you immediately see as, as, as long as 
if we only first look at the lowest order expansion, the epsilon two to one half power, you, you for the solid side, very straightforward. It's only only coming from of this term taking the derivative. Other terms will give you higher order contribution. That's why I'm just collecting everything in this uh, epsilon two to three half powers. That's it. And I still have something over here, but that's not important. Uh, not, it's not going to affect my argument below. And since we are doing everything perturbatively, which means epsilon can be as small as possible. So the terms that are in different power of epsilon, they cannot cancel out each other, right? Because I can choose epsilon as small as possible so that the second, the high order term, they cannot match with the previous order. So in order to have this equality holds, I will need for different order of epsilon, the square root of epsilon, they have to be exactly the same on the left hand side and right hand side, okay? So for the lowest order you are expecting to have is just saying, okay, uh, the solid liquid cohesion density should be the same. Just from these simple insights, you are reaching that conclusion, okay? And you, you, if you think that's the solution, think twice, right? Because basically we are almost solving the same thing here before using numerical method. And we know the solid density and liquid density, they are not the same. But just comparing the lowest order, they are the same, which means this is not a true solution. You will encounter the problem when you plug in this precise solid equal to precise liquid to this higher order than here and the higher order than here, you will see they will not match. If they, are, if they match, which means this should be, this is the solution, and that's something you should get from your previous uh, numerical solution of this PFC, but that's not what you are getting. So you are expecting the inequality uh, will not hold, and just because the reason I explained. So which means there's something fishy about the insights here, right? So since we know the higher order term, they don't balance. So the solution is what? If you want to get something that's actually coming to this higher order term and that could help to balance the coefficient here, immediately you can say, maybe the solution just is not that simple, right? If I only consider that there, there are terms proportional to the square root of, of epsilon, it does not work. So you can add in something else. And the next order you are seeking is actually the epsilon to uh, uh, three halves power. The reason is that immediately you see that from this addition, then the linear term like here, the linear term in the chemical potential will immediately give you something, some contribution in the different order, right? And also, even for the cubic term, there's a, there's a cross product. So that could help us to amend uh, the problem here. So you can do that, and you should do that. And what you are going to see is that, oh great, now because you have two more degree freedom, uh, indeed, a higher order equality will hold as well. But since you have uh, more higher order power in epsilon adding here, so you can imagine, for example, if I have this a plus b to a cube, you can have even higher order contribution in the chemical potential, right? So you should keep writing, there will be like a, epsilon to the five halves power and seven halves power, etc. So now you are getting something agree well, but you will see that at higher order, even when, after you amend your enzyme, you will see the higher order equality will not hold. So the problem still occurs. But it seems like if epsilon is really, really small, you don't have to worry about that detail. Why? Because if epsilon is small, the term I'm adding here, although it's going to help me to fix the higher order correction, but if epsilon is really, really small, uh, whatever you are adding, you are trying to get all this coefficient will be a small correction. So actually the lower order uh, prediction is not that bad. So even we are saying, well, for epsilon is really, really small, right? Uh, the first order saying, okay, the solid liquid density are the same. Is that really bad? Let me jump really quickly here, all right? If you recall the phase diagram we solved numerically before, when epsilon is really, really small, right? You couldn't even really see from this graph that the solid liquid density, there is a gap. So it's not that bad approximation when epsilon is really, really small, okay? Okay, so um, things like this kind of argument will keep going, saying you are going to satisfy uh, your e equality to a certain degree, but after that, things will not work. 
So uh, general insights would be an expansion. So you know you, what you should do in the very beginning, you just keeping adding turns and just plugging the, uh, not plugging, but in, use those insights in your equilibrium conditions. So that's what, what the uh, predictive scheme usually works, right? Just uh, write your solution in terms of, of some small parameters in terms of uh, the polynomial of that. And of course, the solid liquid coexistence will require the same chemical potential and the same pressure. And if you really do that, it will work out everything. Indeed, to the lowest order, you are expecting the solid liquid density has the same value. And you can also work out a value that would be uh, this number. OK? Right. There's a reason. Yeah, uh, you. Yeah, they. Uh, they. That's right. So uh, naively, right? If I don't do those analysis, uh, you just say, okay, generally you should have like uh, one more turn here. That's epsilon times uh, psi bar L one. Mm -hmm. All the uh, all, all other turns. But when you carry out the calculation, you will find all the, all those coefficients. Are zero. So, but because I show you the the reasoning, right? You 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 from the ordering, you know, you you shouldn't adding something like uh, epsilon to the first power. So, uh, but in our paper we did that. <laughs> so just to be consistent, I just uh, uh, used the notation that we had in the paper. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And you can keep work out other things, but uh, it's it's not that worth it to get a lot of coefficient. But the relation about the density gap for the solid liquid coexistence, uh, you, from the analysis, you know it's going to be proportional to the epsilon to the 3 half power, right? So, as I just showed the phase diagram, and here is the numerical solution uh, we, we get yesterday, right here. That's right. And this perturbation solution, if you plug in its negative square root of 45 over, one, over 103 and times the epsilon take to be like 0.05, do the calculation, and it, it predicts the coexistence density is like minus 14.78, right? It's in between. But you know the, the gap will be open at the order of epsilon to the 3 halves power. So uh, I didn't show you how good the next order predict, prediction is, but since you, have, you already have a code to solve the solid liquid coexistence density, you can try to get uh, epsilon as, as small as possible to verify the next order expansion is indeed occurs at the epsilon to the three halves power. Okay? All right. So here is nothing about the amplitude equation, just to give you a feeling how the, the perturbative theory works, uh, perturbation theory works, and you should do that, uh, do the expansion term by turn, things like that. Okay. So now we are going to study the amplitude equation. All right, we're, we're going to use the same technique to study how the special modulation of density wave. Uh, but keep in mind, we are trying to make a connection with the DFT, which I showed you in the very beginning of the class. So since the amplitude equation is about how the amplitude is going, going to vary over the space, so it is, it is possible that we can make a connection here. All right. So... In a PFC simulation, right? So that's the evolution equation you are get. Uh, you well, we we have. So when system you set up system when it reaches solid liquid coexistence, which means by that time the chemical potential is defined as the delta f or uh, delta f over delta psi, which is those terms in the parentheses, right? You are expecting the chemical potential will be the same everywhere in a solid in the liquid and also across the interface. Everywhere in space, they should have a uniform chemical potential, right? So we are requesting that equal to zero, true. But in addition, actually, uh, the whole thing in the parentheses should be a constant. And that constant should be the chemical potential in a solid, in a liquid, and everywhere. It should be the same thing. And since it's, it's the same thing, we can just use whatever we are expecting for the liquid to uh, use in our calculation because in liquid, the, the relation is quite straightforward, right? Just, just the same chemical potential uh, we used a moment ago. 
Then just plugging what it, is this uh, Psi liquid. We know uh, the first order here is the uh, square root of epsilon, but this is Psi C. Oh, sorry, I don't know whether I introduced that properly. Psi C. Uh, just to remind you that uh, I don't want to write so many uh, subscripts. So uh, the, the mean coexisting density, I just call that precisely. All right. So you plug in and you keep track to maybe the, to the next order. Uh, you can see uh, the chemical potential just by plugging those in. You have low, all those terms. But to a lowest order, it's very simple. Just uh, have a coefficient of precisely, but it's a little bit complicated uh, when you go to higher order. So what we were doing here is just saying that we established a, a rule in the phase field crystal that uh, if you have a special fairing profile, right, or density oscillating from solid to a liquid side, if you have that kind of system, any place you pick in space, you plug in that profile on the left-hand side, it has to return the same value as whatever you, you evaluate in the liquid side. That's just a constant, ju ju just a value. I, but at different orders, the left hand side should give me the same answer on the right hand side. So I can also compare the result at different order. Okay, so that will give that will give give us the amplitude equation. Okay. So we just establish the rule that the amplitude profile should uh, should follow should obey. Okay. So now since we are interested in the solid liquid interface, so that that is write down oscillating density profile how it should look like. And this is from a few slides ago. I think we established that, right? It, uh, the amplitude is slow, slowly firing space. And it seems like it's, it is actually firing uh, with the variable of square root of, of epsilon times r. And t is that, all right? Things like that. So as I just described, we don't care about the time firing part because we are looking at the equilibrium solid liquid interface. But having said that, it's uh, actually a lot of work has been carried out for this uh, di uh, dynamic density functional theory. We had a paper uh, in uh, 2015 and 2017, but uh, different approaches, how to get an amplitude equation, uh, has been shown by others. Uh, some really good paper, uh, like by Elder, by Zi Fang Huang, something uh, you can check out. All right. But here, just talk a, a very special case. Uh, nothing changing with time. You are, we are looking at a stationary solid liquid interface, okay? All right, so the amplitude only changes slowly over the length scale that we just described, right? It's uh, how many, like, let spacing, so it should be like one over square root of that. So if epsilon is like 0 0.0001, it's going to, so what that means is that when the solid, when the amplitude starts from solid side to liquid side, it has to go across thousands of, or hundreds of uh, oscillations, right? And also, what we still have here is the uh, a term that cor corresponds to the oscillation of uh, local density wave, so that's okay. So, but now you see, uh, they are cl clear two different length scale, one corresponding to the local oscillation of density wave, right? It just keeps oscillating, and for the, amp for the amplitude, Right, so what it basically feels that, or for the underlying periodicity, right, for that kind of fast oscillation, it's amplitude. So over like few, um, very, very few density oscillations, they don't even really see the density wave oscillation, the, the, the amplitude wave, the amplitude changing, because the amplitude will change over hundreds or thousands that oscillation. So here, basically, you can consider there's the two different length scale. One is really, really long. That's for the amplitude. The other is really, really short for the density wave. So those two length scale, we can treat them like being independent from each other. So that's what we call the multi-scale analysis, something I'm going to talk about now in detail. So just a quick summary. Uh, we know the system has to follow a strict rule, right, at the equilibrium. Whatever the, the psi, it's a function of space, it's going to oscillate, the amplitude is going to decrease or increase, doesn't matter. But when you plug in that in, into left hand side, everywhere in the space, it has to give us the same number on the right or the same scaling relation uh, to the right hand side. Right? So that's the strict rule, the amplitude or the density field has to follow. 
All right. So again, uh, we would like to compare whatever we are getting next with the density function theory or the Ginsburg Lyell theory we developed it before. So we just do the same setting. We're saying we have a planar interface with its normal along the in the z direction, right? So if I only have the, a planar interface, so I have some oscillation go along in the z direction, I don't expect that amplitude will change in the x and y. Only so the amplitude is simply a function of z only. Okay. So uh, we know we can now write a much more general form for a density field for the left hand side. And still, now, and now we know we can expand the density in terms of uh, square root of epsilon and to the third power to the fifth power, uh, et cetera. And a very good guess is that to the zeros order, actually we know the mean density is precise c. To the oscillation, it's, very, it's a pretty good uh, guess saying that it should be something like uh, oscillating density wave, right? But its amplitude could change, right? So actually, we should actually solve for this part. But he will just say, okay, it could look like something like this. Now that, let's work out this uh, what called what we call the multi-scale analysis. All right. So uh, as we established before, uh, we can say they are like a two length scale, right? And those two length scale is associated with associated by this uh, square root of epsilon, right? Right. So capital Z basically is one of the Z component here. So capital Z is the square root of epsilon times the, the, the the z here. All right. Um, and usually the problem we have here could get messy is because uh, there is a special derivative occurring on the left hand side here, right? And now you have so many things depends on x, y, z, and z they are like two different length scale. So the derivative could become messy. For example, we want to find out if there's a function of both the capital Z and small z. Uh, if I take a derivative of that function, I'm expecting to get something must be like A is a function of capital Z, so I take a deri derivative of that. But since those two Z's they are related, I have to take the other like chain rule to deal with that, right? And since I only take the first part, I still have to, to do the derivative for the second part. So usually, every time you, you take a derivative, you are picking up a few more terms. And if you look at the uh, phase field crystal, you have this uh, Laplacian operating on the Laplacian, so it's going to be really messy. All right, but luckily, if we sort of rearrange things, like uh, here I just uh, repla replaced this uh, uh, capital Z and small z relation by one uh, square root of epsilon. So it seems like I can write, the, uh, I can arrange the result like this. I mean, that, that doesn't seem really helps. But once we recognize that the multi-scale expansion is basically a way you can uh, as you can treat that those two length scales are independent length scale. So in the sense that if I can pretend those two variables are independent, the original when I take these derivatives, right, I can simply transform this a simple z direct derivative become this kind of combination of derivatives, right? So in a sense, if the capital Z and small z, they are, we are treating them independently. So the first operator is going to operate on the second part of the function, and which will give me this term, right? So because this tiny z, they don't see the variation in the capital Z, so when I take a derivative, I only left this A out. So the first term will give me something like this. But the second term, they only see variation in capital Z and with one extra square root of epsilon in front. So that operation just recover the first term. So instead of dealing all this derivative over and over, by using this multi-scale ex expansion idea, every time you, we introduce something, some new length scale or time scale, we can just do a simple uh, transformation on the operator, right? So next time, if I'm going to operate like, uh, take the z derivative again, I just apply extra operator in front. So that's going to simplify our calculation. All right, so that's what, what we're going to do, all right? 
z derivative, I can uh, after the transformation become partial partial z plus square root of epsilon and, and the other operation on the capital Z derivative. And because of that uh, transformation uh, or this kind of treatment, we can easily get this uh, Laplace and plus one square kernel transformation. Uh, still require a little bit manipulation. Uh, I will leave that as an exercise to you. But you can show that equal, uh, every time you see original appearing, uh, this kind of operator, you just simply replace by whatever on the, on the right hand side here. Yeah, you just uh, manipulate what I, I, I show you here, you can quickly get this result. All right. Okay, so the exciting part is coming because we are going to really see the relation because you already start to see all these derivative happening, right? So maybe there is something uh, connect us with this uh, uh, orientation dependent square gradient term here. All right. Okay. All right, so now uh, since we, we know how to write this term, right, in two variables, we can simply plug in whatever uh, or uh, plug in our insight. We can, we can plug in this psi into this equation, e this equation and just requesting that at a different order of epsilon, they, they, they should be the same on left hand side and right hand side. Right. So for example, if we, we look at the lowest order contribution, like square root of epsilon to that uh, order, if you look for that, because we just plug in the solution here, right? So the lowest order here is the uh, square root of epsilon. Right? If I plug in here the first term, that's going to be a higher order term to the epsilon to the three halves power. So that's not what we want here. And this Laplacian operator would pick up uh, all these things. So there is like uh, square root of epsilon, but also I have to times itself, right? So it's a high order term. And also there's, uh, so those two terms times this uh, first term will be higher order. So the, the, lowest whole, the lowest order actually is this operator times the, fir the first term here. And all this psi cube power, can you get a constant? Uh, you probably will get at least epsilon to the three half power, right? So everything on the left hand side, only this L square times psi naught is at the order of epsilon one half. Others is not. And on the right hand side, this one turn at the order of epsilon to the one half power, right? So that's why that's how you reach the first criteria. If I want the equality holds, right? To a lowest order, I'm re requ requesting that this operating on psi naught equal to psi c. And that's how you actually should get this psi c, psi zero solution from, right? That's just our good guess in the very beginning, but uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't use that. But now we know, okay, the way we can obtain the solution for, for psi naught is actually solving this equation. So L squared is a linear operator, and the psi c is just a constant. So quite trivially, you are going to get the same solution. So psi c here just to fulfill the, the constant term. And we know this L squared kernel prefer to pick up the, the, the density wave with the wave number, uh, the magnitude of wave, wave number equal to one. And in, in the beginning, if, we're, if we are talking about this uh, BCC lattices, so then this summation should be sum of the 12 residual lattice factors, okay? Okay, so if we look at the next order things, all right, it's a little bit complicated. What we are going to get is, for example, uh, this L square operator can operate on the next term in the solution, right? So that will give me this epsilon to the three half power. So that's the first term. And you can also have uh, those few combinations, but uh, you, you can work out detail, but, but uh, trust me, you are going to get this kind of solution. But uh, let me see, it's actually important. So that maybe let's uh, take a look. All right, so clear you from the psi cube term, right? If you want to get the order, this order, so basically you can get that order from this cube. And other terms will be higher than this order. So for the Laplace in plus one kernel, if you just plug in the thing here, I think only just like we described, only this term, right? Only this term. 
and multiply by this term, operate on this term will give you this power. So that's right. So I'm using this to get this result. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But um, the problem now is that um, we are not actually looking to get solution for Psi two, right? I mean the the concept of this uh, perturbative, perturbative solution, of course, is that once you got the lowest order solution, if you want to refine your solution better, you are going to keep going and going and going and get a higher, higher order correction. But that's not what we are trying to do here. We can actually use this relation to get the rule that Psi zero should follow. And the reason is the following, or the way is the following. First, you, you see that Psi two here is also being operated by this linear operator, right? So they would have the same um, mathematical uh, differential structure as before. But we, we know the solution of that is composed of the density wave of this residual electric factor. So if we have a linear operator somewhere on the left hand side, if it's equal to something on the right hand side, also have the, the oldest solution of this uh, residual density waves, which means you can think about a case is that uh, if you have a simple harmonic oscillator, right, and you know what's the uh, natural frequency, the solution of that. But now if you're adding the equation to the simple harmonic oscillator, a driving term, it also has the same frequency. It's going to blow up the system, right? So here, although it, we are not talking about the time evolution, but in, in the same sense that you have this uh, linear operator is going to have certain mode it prefers. And whatever I, I, I have in the equation, if it has all those features of this, this uh, preferred mode, it's going to blow up the solution. Right? So in order actually to have a Psi 2, you will need this kind of solvability condition, which means what all the terms here, all the rest of the term in this equation, cannot have anything like the density wave with the wave factor that's the in the principal recipient electric factors. Otherwise, it's going to blow up. So that's the typical solvability condition. But since on the right hand side, everything are just constant, just a number. So they are not, not going to contribute anything like exponential IKR and K is the recipient electric factors. So, but here, for Psi naught, Psi naught is actually a constant plus a lot of plane waves, right? So that's actually will contribute terms like, like the, the density waves. Let's take a look at the, what the solvability condition gives us, right? So basically we are requesting that this thing equals zero or it should not contain anything like the plane wave of the principal recipient that is vector. I mean, what it allows is actually, for example, for example, if I'm taking uh, BCC 110 density wave, for, for example, in one of the solution, this cubic term could, could give me what? If I have those three things times together, I can have exponential I330. So that part is fine because it's not going to be resonant with this operator. So for those things, it's fine. But whatever you cannot get is it's whatever uh, a, a, a single density wave with the recipient electric factor that uh, uh, belongs to the BCC. Okay, so just a little bit detailed, and we can get the amplitude equation. Okay, so that that is just give one specific case, saying that for this kernel, if you want to get something like the density wave of zero one one, right? Uh, usually you are expecting for example, a term from the first term here, right? Because simply, if Psi naught here, I just pick up the 110, uh, 0, 011 density wave, right? Then I'm going to pick up uh, this contribution. So minus one is trivial, but just pay close attention to this partial z square. And because this is, is operate on the, the small z, so if you write that as the kx, x, k, y, y, k, z, z, when you take a derivative, that's going to pick up only the z component of, of o, 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 1, 1, right? So that's why I have this extra k dot z derivative, k dot z squared, sorry, turns here, right? And other I just copy, 
right? The four and the one minus one here. So that's the first term, and we haven't get into the cubic term, but we already have something very nice here, is that z is what? The direction that the planar interface, the modulation direction, right? Which means that's the interface normal. Without even look, look at other terms, I already know that when I have the complete amplitude equation, I already have a term that is orientation dependent. Because now I only look at the 0, 1, 1, and, but the coefficient depends on the wave number, the product of the wave number and the interface normal, and it also squared that, the relation. And rest of that will be a special variation, right, the second derivative. And since we already write down the evolution equation, and that's something you are expecting also from the density functional theory or the gains banal theory, right, the second derivative, but whatever in front, like a diffusion coefficient should be an orientation dependent coefficient, okay. But if you really want to work out the, the cubic term, not big deal, you just plug in that uh, solution, you got this uh, standard coefficient 1, 3, 3, 1, and whatever. Uh, but for example, uh, the linear term, you immediately immediate pick up this uh, 3 precise c square and a, right? So that will give you this plane wave. If you really want to work out other terms, uh, for example, if you want to see whether you, have, you can pick up two plane waves and that would combine and give you a 011, you find that it's possible because if you pick a 101 and a minus 10, so when they add up, right, the first x component, one minus one is zero, the second is zero plus one is one, the third is one plus zero is one. So indeed you can have at least many combinations, I just list two of them. So you can do the same thing, keep track of everything, you can have a complete equation, and because some of those things, all, you collect a coefficient of, of exponential ik 011r they have to be zero, so you have an equation for that. So let me just show you the, the equation, it's right here. Ignore, it should be zero. I mean, I just described, you can also derive the amplitude equation, uh, a dynamic, dynamic amplitude equation. But for the solid liquid coexistent interface, that term is actually, you can set that to zero, right? So uh, as, as I just showed you, you can have this uh, uh, directional interface normal and also depends on the uh, direction of your, uh, uh, your selection of these uh, residual lattice factors. And all those basically you, you, you know, if the solid liquid, they are in coexistence. And to a lowest order expansion, the solid density and liquid density are the same. So we don't have to worry about the density gap. So the only variable is the amplitude, right? So all this amplitude, the bulk term, right? The, the, the purpose is, is, is just one thing, just to form a, a double well potential. When A equal to zero, the liquid phase, you have a minima with energy zero, and all those coefficients is going to guarantee that when A is the proper solid amplitude, you are going to reach the other minima with the energy zero, that's it. So it is exactly like what we have seen or what we have been constructed for the Gaines or Landau theory, and especially because of, oh, let me see. Okay, and because of uh, this square, uh, this uh, orientation dependent coefficient in front, and that's why you are expecting to get this anisotropic density profile uh, across the interface, and that will give rise to the inter interfacial anisotropy. Yeah, of course, uh, how do we comprehend? I probably have al already addressed. It's a, just a double well potential. Uh, if you, you really want to see that, you can just assume a very, uh, because in a bulk phase, everything is, is isotropic, so you can assume they, they all take the, the same value of A, so it's going to give this kind of structure, so those uh, local turn, local potential, will give you something like a double wave. I mean, well, here is the evolution equation, but when you do the integration, trying to recover the energy, the energy will be like a double wave potential. Okay, okay, so finally we make the connection between the density functional theory and the PFC. So you can say surprisingly that uh, just with this pattern formation idea in, uh, in mind, and when you do the amplitude expansions, it uh, immediately uh, rediscover important physics 
behind this uh, interfacial uh, anisotropy. So here, just to, to re remind you again where we started from, we start from a density functional theory and what we did. And because this, uh, again, the square gradient term, we are showing you that the PFC somehow has its, its roots in the classical density functional theory. So here is the uh, result uh, uh, I showed you yesterday. We can also compare with the MD simulation. All right. So just one uh, final thing to do is that there is uh, things to be uh, agreement between the uh, amplitude equation in the Gainsborough Landau or from the density functional theory to the PFC, right? You see this uh, square gradient coefficient that depends on directional cosine. And also you can collect the quadratic order term, right? So if you try to reconstruct a free energy functional from this kind of evolution equation, so you immediately will get the quadratic term with a coefficient like is associated with this three precise c squared minus one. And other are just uh, nonlinear coefficient and just for the purpose will give you a double well potential, nothing else. So as you know from the density functional theory, only two things are, they are important, right? Just from the quadratic, quadratic coefficient of amplitude, that's, that's we can associate with the inverse of the structure factor. And also the coefficient in front of this, uh, meson, this orientation dependent square gradient coefficient term. And actually we can map with those two things, right? We can try to find a mapping, how to map those two things, those two numbers to the two physical important physics. So uh, there are two things you can do, right? Because uh, you always have this degree freedom of uh, resetting what's the proper length scale. For example, this is the density functional theory with everything with the real physical dimension. Okay, like Z has the dimension of meters of length. But I can either do a dimension is or redefine a lens. So that's going to help me to absorb one of the parameters. So I can just set maybe one over S equal to one. But by doing so, I can reintroduce what's the, uh, the lens or what's the, 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 the unit of the energy I'm measuring from. All right. So for example, I can even uh, define a new energy as this delta F divided by rho zero over two kBT uh, times this one. The whole thing I can divide to a left hand side, which means I'm measuring my free energy difference in, in the unit of what I was describing here. So you can redefine or rescale your energy. You can, you, from there, you absorb one parameter, one physical parameter. You can also, by rescaling lens, and uh, then doing that, you can absorb the other parameter. So the, sa the same thing you can do the same for PFC. Then in the end you, 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 you can compare what's the one-to-one -one correspondence, okay? So that's what I'm trying to get. All right, so in the end, uh, that's the detail I didn't include in, in the lecture today, but after you do that, you, so that's why you see there is this one minus three per side bar square in the denominator, right? Because that's actually what, you are, uh, what we are seeing right here, okay? But this is just a, a a little bit of effort to the uh, analysis, but in the end, you can get this mapping. So for BCC iron, using the uh, MHSS squared potential, which are plugging all the numbers, you will find this epsilon very close to 0.1. It's actually 0.00923. And in a PFC, if you set that parameter, you can recover that exactly give you how the density weight decay from the solid to liquid and compare with MD, of course. All right, any questions so far? If there's a question, I can address the question and I will make uh, another comments about this uh, interfacial anisotropy. It's, uh, it's actually a precise C I'm getting. It's just a constant, a number. Like uh, for BCC, it's minus square root of 45 over 103. Yeah. So for different structure, you do the same analysis, you get you get that number. So that's a constant. That's yes. Q zero is the Ah, it, it's the uh, it's Q zero. I think oh, Q zero actually is K max. I think. 
uh, yeah, Q0 is it, under it. Uh, so that is it, it, it is less probable, exactly. It, it is less probable, that's right. And so you have the structure factor and the curvature of the structure factor at the first peak. Right. Which you get from an atomistic point. Right. Using an ADA intervention. Yeah, or some other point, right, that's right. So, Basically, the epsilon that you use in the PFC can be connected to the potential you use using the first peak of the structure factor. Right. And the lattice parameter, whatever you calculate for the system. Right. And uh, the other one is a structure dependent constant, so you evaluate epsilon. Yeah. And psi bar comes from the fact that uh, the coexistence happens for given epsilon at some point for the liquid and the PC. Right. So any of those uh, sidebar you can choose. For that, uh, that's a uh, structural dependent, right? Right. Yeah, right. yeah that's right. Uh, but for BCC liquid, uh, it's for fixed. Can be for a different. Uh, oh no. Given epsilon is fixed. Oh, uh, so. So the, the different epsilon will come for different BCC structures. For iron, in that oh. diagram, we have an epsilon. All oh, right, right. So um, you, you mean if we are using a different potential for MD, mm -hmm. we'll get slightly slightly different number. So right. So I'm trying to see how the epsilon itself, because it is like temperature, mm -hmm. it should also be different for the given BCC structure itself. Right? But here we are saying that for a given BCC there is only one epsilon. Um, so in the epsilon sidebar space, I'm just saying that one mm -hmm. value only is empty. Oh, I mean, the psi bar here is the uh, coexistence density, right? I, I mean, in, uh, what I should say, the, the, co the coexistence density should be this number times the square root of epsilon. So if that epsilon changes, the true, the, 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 the numerical solution of the coexistence density you got in PFC can change. Right. But here, since we are doing everything perturbatively, that precise zero is just the uh, always a constant for PCC. It's just a number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yeah, okay, so uh, my interpretation is this, right? So uh, we are using only uh, partial information from the density functional theory, and because I would like to link that with the interfacial width and also the energy. So the epsilon here, in the end, would have a realistic solid liquid interface, even the width that they are same. So how does that associate with the temperature, right? So now if you pick a different material, so they have different potentials, and that potential could be strong or, or could be weak, but at a given temperature, there will be an entropic effect. So for a rather weaker interaction of, of atoms, it's going to have a very diffusive interface, right? Because the entropy uh, dominates. So I would interpret like, uh, for different material, the reason you are expecting to have different epsilon is just because the competition between entropy and the uh, potential. And that potential is also show, is going to show up on this structure factor. That's why epsilon is slightly different. If epsilon is less temperature, mm -hmm. I can have the BCC IM at different temperatures. Well, but for, co for, for co but you have to be at a melting temperature, right? In order to have... So this is only for coexistence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's for e e equilibrium solid liquid interface. So how would I choose for other temperatures what that value is? So yeah, yeah. so uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, my interpretation for epsilon is more related to the interfacial property. And the, the, the thickness... If you want to connect to interfacial property, then you will do this. Right. And in a sense, we are also fixing the temperature, right? Because temperature... So, what yeah, if, uh, equilibrium or coexistence right. demand that that... <laughs> So the temperature and the fact that this is iron is 
Okay, so uh, what would I use as epsilon? So, uh, it, I mean, if we change the temperature, right? So we no longer care about the solid liquid. We probably only care about solid or the liquid, mm -hmm. right? So, in that case, for example, if I care more about the elasticity because so many uh, uh, material behavior might be uh, the elastic could be crucial. So there, I will try to start from uh, some other physical theory about elasticity to see how the PFC work out and to make the connection what the epsilon I should be choosing for that phenomenon. Being said, uh, having said that, uh, this is our work in 2007, and in the same year, uh, um, uh, Elder Professor Elder also uh, has a paper on the density function theory. His own interpretation uh, how the epsilon can map to uh, temperature, things like that. So if we have time, we, we will talk about that. Yeah, if not, you can check out his paper in 2007. So he still start with the density function theory and he can expand term by term and trying to see uh, what the epsilon is corresponding to. Uh, I think in his case, he's relating the compressibility of a liquid and also uh, the elastic, elasticity of solid, things like that. So it can be done in different way. And since there is only one control parameter in PFC, and you don't expect, I mean, they, 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 so you, you don't ex expect only one parameter can, can give you all the property, uh, material behavior. But if the problem you are working on, the interfacial anisotropy or in the interfacial energy, the behavior is important, then there, there, is, a one, there is a theory that you, you, you should try to make connection with your, your PFC. Okay, so uh, one more comment I would like to make is that um, because all the scaling concept I just introduced, right? You can, you can scale out S of K, you can scale out C double prime. So there's nothing left to be material dependent, right? In a sense, in, I mean, even you can say for different materials, you can have this epsilon, right? But look back, if we are going to solve these kind of equations, uh, precisely just a number. So with this kind of equation, you select some interface. Although we are talking about epsilon equal to a certain value, that's a BCC iron, but it doesn't really matter. In the end, you are going to get the, the same uh, interfacial energy for, for, certain, for, for, for a given uh, crystal orientation. And you will get something different, it's just its magnitude will be different. But the anisotropy is going, always going to be the same. So to the lowest order approximation, a PFC will give you a very unique uh, interfacial anisotropy. And all the contribution is just simply from the lattices. Right? So, so to the lowest order, you are expecting quite something universal. So that's why I, 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 I love this Ginsburg Landau and the PFC approach. But how do we make out this? Uh, there's a material dependent anisotropy coming out. I mean, we actually see that happening, right? So uh, my answer to that is, there are several things we simplified during the discussion. So let me show you. When we introduce like higher order term couplings, right? So, so of course we only uh, return the uh, two particle correlation function in the calculation. And even when we introduce the higher order couplings, right? We just say they have certain way of couple together and they will form a very nice close either triangle or parallelogram in the reciprocal space. But you see here, we are assuming that their contribution doesn't matter how you combine, they all con contribute the same. But there's nothing there to support this assumption. I mean, one way it works is that there is no contribution from the correlation function. So if you only assume those contributions is from the local bulk energy, then the equal contribution will be true. But we know the, this is just a truncation of expansion, right? You should have like three particle, four particle correlation function in a free space. It's going to make all those, some of those interaction to be the K factor dependent. 
So with those considered into your model, that can give rise to a different interfacial energy. So I think more, and of course, uh, for different potentials, the correlation function, higher order correlation function, could be quite different, which means it's going to add into different combinations of these higher order density wave interactions. So I think that could be the reason uh, why even our theory, very simple theory, predicts a universal anisotropy. But in reality, we are expecting it should be a material dependent. So I, I would say to a lowest order, the PFC is doing fine. Um, it could be an uh, interest for people to extend the discussion to higher order to see whether the PFC can actually uh, model uh, something material dependent, how you incorporate with that. Right. All right. So uh, that's all I would like to discuss today. Uh, any questions? All right. Nope. Good. Yeah, uh, the is it's not very clear whether they're really converted. Oh, sorry. The first, uh, the the second term. Right. Right. So, uh, usually we, yeah, so, uh, usually we have to be sure that we are expanding around something really small. Uh, th that's a trick. But indeed, uh, whether there's a singularity in your problem, you, you are doing that, maybe you encounter something. That could happen. So there are many, uh, I mean, one of the famous examples is actually people trying to also predict the uh, nonlinear oscillation. Mm -hmm. And what they found is that uh, you cannot naively assume uh, after the nonlinear driving, uh, the, 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 the frequency is, is, is approximately the same. So uh, that, that original perturbation theory fails, so you have to introduce something new. So I would say the perturbation theory is more like, a, well, in a sense, parameter fitting, right? You are saying, I'm adding a term. So one more degree of freedom, would that do a better job? But if you are adding, constructing your, your answer is wrong, it's going to be a disaster, right? So, if that happens, you probably have to find a way to figure out a problem and reintroduce a good insight. That's usually how it is done. I think that's called the uh, link set something perturbation. So they figure out the, uh, for a nonlinear oscillator, the oscillating frequency is quite different. It's a little bit different than the simple harmonic uh, oscillation. So if you don't add that correction, your solution is going to be to blow up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, in what context they are doing? Because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the first order result will be that uh, it is the curvature and the, the growth rate is given. The last piece of the curvature is given. You can think those five by mm -hmm. 20 is the last piece. Mm -hmm. And the del square t is curvature. So yeah, yeah. But you get but, by doing mm -hmm. an asymptotic analysis again, expanding and taking term by term. Mm -hmm. um, I would say what we are having here is something like the phase field, right? And if you want to do a further analysis, like you described, like how fast, if it is curved, right, how it's going to, to go, uh, I think that's something further can do, right? That'd be, I mean, for curved uh, surface, I mean, it would be something to, 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 to extend that to a curved surface as well. Right? Oh, yeah, just one more comment about uh, the Ginsburg-Landau theory that we have been working on is that, uh, uh, we, we use that theory to study uh, equilibrium solid liquid uh, interface, right? We can get a profile. But we have also uh, have done the case is for adding a, uh, to lower temperature a little bit. So in the double potential, we are lowering the one of the minima. So I, we can start to drive the planar surface. And we are showing that the kinetic anisotropy, which means the anisotropy in the kinetic coefficient is related to the equilibrium profile, right? 
And something I think the face field crystal maybe can uh, can also try to extend to understand uh, that anisotropy as well. And something maybe we can talk about a little bit more tomorrow. Okay, so that's my final final comment. Um, for the face field crystal, the integration we are writing is uh, on the side by side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mean? Those side by side is just. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But even then, it does not give you reducing diameter. No, no, I mean, it's fine because uh, uh, in the limit, just like this case, for really small epsilon, right? Uh, and we know the mean density, there's no difference. So, Allen Kahn equation becomes perfectly fine. <laughs> so, I think uh, PFC will we discover the intervention anisotropy as predicted by the Gaines Volnell theory for really small epsilon. But what's interesting is that. For a study larger, or when we deviate from that really small epsilon limit, you start to need more material or atoms coming right from the, 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 the far liquid side to the coastal interface in order to solidify. And that's going to uh, modulate or change the uh, interface kinetic a little bit. So maybe uh, PFC can be used to study that effect. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.